Okay, so good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining this uh, online uh, session. Um, I will share my screen in order to, uh, to make the presentation visible. And again, I kindly ask you to uh, see if it is uh, clear. So do you, do you see and do you hear me? Okay, perfect. So I go back here. Okay, so uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the University of Gastronomic Science, Antonella Campanini, that she's doing this coordination um, to give me this uh, opportunity to, um, yeah, to share with you um, this topic. I choose uh, um, a topic that already um, somehow in my class uh, cover, but uh, I would like to focus even more on the interlink, you know, on the on the overlapping between uh, agrobiodiversity, climate change, uh, local variety. So the, the, these three issues for me are very important in my research activity and also didactic. Um, so the content of today I have tried to schematize uh, in this uh, in this six section. Uh, I will give a, as much as possible short introduction about the global challenges of today's um, uh, I will give some data about climate change um, and then I will shift to the need of ecological transition and uh, the possibility to, um, to develop agroecology and organic agriculture as a, a, an approach to uh, climate change mitigation and adaptation and also the use of agrobiodiversity, in particular the use of local and traditional varieties, in particular in cereals. And then I will give uh, the, we, I will present the little uh, good example of uh, the House of Biodiversity at, at UNISC. I will try to make it in 30-40 uh, minutes and to give, uh, let's say, 5-10 minutes for question and answer at the end. Okay, so um, what are the global challenges today? I already uh, very often share this uh, with you. Anyhow, we are in a growing uh, feeding population, um, in a trend of urbanization and aging of population, and of course the double um, malnutrition side, from one side the hunger, on the other side the obesity and uh, micronutrient deficiency, deficiency, and of course uh, the global health situation about chronic disease. Uh, and at the moment, for example, we are in a crisis of uh, uh, coronavirus. So I really hope that all of you are, of course, in good health and in particular in good mood and facing this difficult situation as an opportunity. Um, the Global uh, Sustainable Development uh, Goals uh, highlighted 17 points and uh, climate action, the 13, is one of these. And it's very nice to see that food link uh, the 17 goals, uh, uh, starting with the biosphere and natural uh, science, shifting to society till uh, economy and in general uh, sustainability issue. Now I'm going to present uh, four or five uh, research paper from other colleagues around the world that link uh, uh, agriculture with, uh, um, with, with, uh, with action, in particular with lifestyle and it's to see the important relationship that, that uh, connect agriculture with, uh, uh, with food and uh, sustainability, environmental in particular. Uh, environmental protection and development. The first paper is about uh, uh, some colleagues from US where they have tried to make a scenario um, in US um, simulating that the whole population of US will have uh, 10 different uh, diet scenario and how the carrying capacity of US will be affected. So we have 10 different diets from baseline the Western diets uh, till uh, uh, completely vegan exclude uh, all livestock products so 10 different uh, um, levels of these two opposite trends. And what is the effect on carrying capacity? So what is the um, land hectares uh, per person needed to feed for one year the population? So if we have the baseline uh, intake, um, one person will need 0 0.74 hectares, so almost one hectare to feed themselves. 
if we decrease slowly the uh, meat and um, uh, eggs, uh, all dairy and, and other animal source product, uh, go till vegan completely, the carrying capacity will uh, shift and decrease till 0.13. Another example is another uh, paper from um, uh, a colleague that made the same uh, scenario worldwide, uh, uh, this time counting the carbon emission. So how many CO2 tons equivalent will be needed per capita, produced by capita using the diet scenario. And again, the baseline is the highest in terms of uh, carbon cost uh, emission both uh, for the food and for the production phase, so for, also for the farming activity, the yellow, and this emission decrease uh, if we have a vegan or less meat uh, dairy. Then there is another link in this paper that uh, highlight again different five diets scenario um, and show the linkages in greenhouse uh, emission energy demand and land occupation so similar to the previous paper before and in the in three in these three example the scenario the uh, diet q1 uh, it's the highest uh, that is the the one that uh, eat more uh, animal based uh, or less uh, uh, less ve vegetarian more animal based uh, food uh, is the highest both in greenhouse gases, energy demand and land uh, occupation and, and slowly decrease uh, till the Q5 uh, that is the uh, more, not completely vegan, but let's say less uh, uh, animal product uh, fed base. And if we look at the typology of production, so um, uh, the more, uh, uh, the highest is the quantity of organic food in those diets, uh, so from 0 0.03, the medium 0 0.23, so 23 percentage, from 3 percentage to 23 percentage till 63 percentage of the total food diet is organic, the amount of greenhouse gases decrease, the amount of energy demand decrease, the land occupation uh, it's a little bit contradicting. Let's say at the beginning it increased. Why it increased the land occupation if we use organic product? Because in order to produce organic food, uh, we need more land because the productivity per hectare is a little bit uh, um, lower. Uh, but in, in this other very important paper that uh, came out two years ago, uh, they made a um, scenario, FAO people and um, um, also a group from FIBOL Research um, Institute in Switzerland, uh, they made a long-term uh, studies and they compare scenario of feeding the world with 100% uh, organic agriculture and they found out that it's possible, so it's possible to feed, uh, making of course all calculation about uh, protein, uh, um, nutrients, um, nitrogen, land, if we reduce meat consumption and food waste, but still it's possible to feed 100% organic. And finally, I would like also to make a, a reference between uh, uh, organic consumption and health, uh, because there are very important French studies, Nutrinet, that went out for um, more or less uh, um, seven years, eight years, for 70,000 volunteers. They found out uh, after a long term circulation that uh, there is an effect uh, between eating organic food and reduction of uh, cancer uh, risk, in particular the breast and the lymphomas. Why I'm introducing this? Because, of course, sustainable diets uh, does not have only an impact on, on health, but it's fundamental and there is a very strong connection between biodiversity and ecosystem. So, FAO defines sustainable diets with those that are not only food secure, but uh, respectful of biodiversity, culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair, affordable, and nutritional. Mm -hmm. And this is how the, let's say, so it's a flower, it's not just one aspect, it's not just uh, food security, but in general, it's food uh, sovereignty. And one example, or a good example of, of, uh, of diets uh, is, uh, is not one, only one, but one example is Mediterranean diets, uh, with at the base, uh, very important, is regular physical activity, uh, conviviality, biodiversity and seasonality, and so the Q2 
culinary, no? the cultural activity related to food. So it's not just a list of uh, good or bad products. So there is no, no need to, for example, criticize too much meat consumption. But on the other hand, is how it is produced, how it is consumed, how, my, how often. And it's very important, the, the whole food system from crop, harvesting, fishing, conservation, processing, preparation, till full food consumption. So the whole set of activity. Um, Finally, as a very short introduction, there is already a lot of paper that connect the COVID emergency with the food system. So as an example, I choose the last IPES food uh, uh, publication that uh, highlight three important um, relevant points. For example, uh, the fact that COVID is also, a, uh, as already Professor um, uh, Silvio Greco highlights, so the, the, the zoonotic spillover, no? it's a, an effect of industrial agricultural activity, in particular livestock intensification, that create habitat loss, and so uh, the system is less um, resilient, uh, and so there is a direct uh, impact on natural ecosystem. Moreover, the spread of pathogens, uh, it's, uh, uh, make it more strong by climate change, so ecosystem and land use change, like deforestation, biodiversity, and many other loss, uh, increase uh, the, the weaknesses, the weak point of the environment. <clears throat> and like many other pandemia, like uh, ADS, uh, Ebola, SARS, uh, Lyme disease, they are very strong rooted into uh, environmental changes. So there is an important uh, relationship between vulnerabilities and uh, resiliencies, in particular resilience in agro-food system. And of course, uh, hundreds of people that live in um, hunger, malnutrition, poverty uh, are even more exposed to vulnerability. <clears throat> when we talk about climate change, uh, we talk about a uh, um, long-term effect that already was started to be highlighted, for example, in the publication of 2009 of the Rockstrom groups about planetary boundaries among uh, loss of biodiversity and um, biosphere integrity. And the fact is that uh, carbon dioxide concentration has been increased uh, recently in the last 50 years, starting from 2,219, 300 uh, CO2 concentration till uh, 380 or 370. And this is the, the global um, CO2 emission by world uh, since, uh, let's say, 300 years ago. And we see very clearly that in the last uh, decades, uh, there, there, there was, there is a huge increase of CO2 emission. Where these emissions come from, okay? They, mainly it's in, involved China, US, uh, and of course also other uh, group of countries like uh, partly Europe, Russia, and less other parts of the world. Um, and the increase of CO2, of course, uh, caused the greenhouse effect. So an, another fact is that the temperature increased, uh, atmosphere temperature increased in the last 50 years above uh, 1.2 uh, Celsius degree. So we are facing the hotter uh, temperature than, than, than ever in our, in our um, earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, the International Panel of Climate Change made also scenario for the future, for the next 50 years. And they found out uh, that in a low emission mi mi mitigation scenario, so in the best condition, the temperature will increase only 2.6 Celsius degree. In the worst scenario, that means uh, business as usual, if we continue like this, the temperature will increase 8.5 Celsius degree. And the effect of these are already very clear. For example, in uh, the decrease of uh, average uh, runoff, so decrease of rain, uh, is affecting already, for example, Mediterranean area with a loss of mean 40 percentage. Um, and Mediterranean basin is, is a hot spot for biodiversity, so will affect uh, in the long term also all, all our agro-food system. Within this uh, um, discourse, what is the role of agriculture? Because of course it's easy to say, okay, we have to reduce somehow transport and also uh, pollution from industry, that actually is something that we are facing at the moment. At the moment in COVID, 
um, emergency and this lockdown, we have uh, uh, reduced uh, huge amounts of tons of CO2, just reducing, stopping flying, stopping using car and, and industrial production. On the other hand, we have the role of agriculture that is also part of my daily job. Um, so agriculture could have a positive effect, but also a negative effect. So uh, without any logic, agriculture could cause uh, greenhouse gases. And in this paper, the mean is between 15 and 30 percentage, in particular by land conversion to agriculture. So if we cut a forest and we convert a permanent forest into agricultural land, tilled land, we um, transform a lot of uh, carbon that is stuck into the soil into CO2 gases that goes into the air. Another important source uh, is uh, use of methanes by um, animal manure and also uh, massive use of mineral fertilizer and uh, nitrogen uh, waste uh, in, in, in animal. So this figure just uh, uh, summarizes different sources of greenhouse gases, in particular uh, nitrogen oxygen nitroso, that um, a part of land use change uh, is caused by fertilizer and uh, uh, intensive livestock fermentation. In Europe, uh, a recent paper calculated the amount of uh, uh, the, the role of agriculture in uh, greenhouse gases and it was calculated, it is calculated around 10 percentage of the whole global emission. And again, the uh, source of input are mainly uh, cattle uh, and, and, and dairy farms, so 5% of the global greenhouse gases in Europe come from intensive livestock, and the rest is mainly um, uh, use of uh, nitrogen chemical fertilization and also tillage of the soil. In Italy, it's uh, a little bit less, so it is estimated around 7%, so a little bit less, um, and more or less uh, is the same uh, from the same source. So again, it's mainly anthropogenetic emission from the agricultural sector. Um, last year, two years ago, let's say, uh, I downloaded this picture uh, that uh, highlight the nitric oxide emission from Europe, from the satellite. And it's very, maybe it's not so visible from, from the little picture, but the, the red zone is Pianura Padana. So Pianura Padana is the most um, has the highest uh, nitric oxide emission and here we are in November uh, and for sure there is a strong correlation between the use of uh, uh, input fertilizer, nitrogen fertilizer for seeding the crop, the, the winter crop. And so this is evidence and again there is probably uh, a direct also there are already some papers that highlight the connection between pollution in Pinona Padana and the high level of COVID uh, dissemination in, in this period. So it's clear, this is, was just a short introduction to highlight that there is the need uh, of, a, of a changes. And again, this period is a great opportunity if we take it as, as a, an opportunity to change. Um, first of all, I would like to clarify some terms. So what climate resilience means the resiliency is the capacity of a system to uh, answer, to respond to external uh, disturbances. It's also a physical characteristic. Um, and climate adaptation, as defined by, by the e EPPC uh, group, uh, is an adjustment in natural or human system in order to respond to changes, to the stimuli, no? so trying to have a beneficial opportunity from it. And the mitigation activity of climate change are all natural climate solutions in order to conserve, restore and improve management of land and of ecosystem in order from one side to increase carbon storage back to the soil, on the other hand to reduce greenhouse gas emission in, in the atmosphere. Okay. So agroecology is claimed in those days to be a good uh, solution, a good uh, method. And uh, a very important paper, a uh, document from uh, um, UNDP and, and FAO that is called HLPA, so the High Level of Ex Panel of Experts, um, developed a paper internationally where um, the principle of agroecology were be 
have been summarized in uh, 13, so from recycling, input uh, reduction, soil health, animal health, biodiversity, synergies, economy of diversification, co-creation of knowledge, social value, fairness, connectivity and land and natural resource governance and finally participation. So there are a huge, um, let's say, a, a good uh, a different uh, um, principle that goes from natural science till the social and economic science. Agroecology is defined as a tripartite, as a scientific discipline, as a movement, and also as a list of practices. And now I will focus the rest of my presentation in what are good practices in order to uh, mitigate and adapt to climate change. Um, for example, the uh, role of agriculture in climate change, again, is very important. One of the first activities is to uh, increase soil carbon sequestration practices. For, for example, long-term crop rotation, in particular with leguminous crop, and use of green manure or any source of organic fertilizer, compost, uh, are all good sources of input for the soil. On the other hand, reduction of uh, uh, greenhouse gases emission means uh, conservation practices and in particular uh, reduction or no tillage system, so conservative tillage system. Mm -hmm. And there are already a lot of evidence, in particular in the organic uh, managed plots, uh, from results from long-term research that I also contributed to, 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 to calculate and, and disseminate, show that uh, um, organic managed soil can um, quite fast compare for a soil that is a very resilient, very long term, that doesn't change very easily. In, in 10 years, it's possible to increase uh, um, with, with evidence the content of carbon into the soil if it is managed organically. There are also many other um, practices, agroecological practices, that can improve. And in particular, I would like to focus in the agro, um, agro, agro biodiversity one. So I will focus looking at the different agroecological cropping practice from the field scale till the cropping system till the landscape level. So the three uh, from the smallest to the highest. I will focus on one of them, the cultivar choice and the use of mixture. Why? First of all, because agrobiodiversity that is, uh, uh, let's say, worldwide defined as uh, the variety and variability of animals, plants and microorganisms, uh, but it's not only a um, genetic resource, it's deal with people. So agriculture is the interlink between culture and nature. So it is, it is the domain that includes uh, natural resource uh, with the local culture and knowledge. So it's very important that agrobiodiversity has been developed by farmer, basically, so by human activity. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways in order to in conserve and improve agrobiodiversity. From one side, there is ex situ conservation, that basically means uh, germoplast bank. There are um, more than, than 104,000 genetic banks around the world, and uh, in those banks, uh, we humankind collects six million accessions, so six millions of different plant species. And Svalbard in Norwegian is one of the, let's say, most secure because it was thought to, it was developed under the ice, uh, but the climate change unfortunately went faster than expected uh, 20 years ago. Uh, and so the, 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 the ice, um, layer is becoming thicker and thicker and the bank is not anymore protected by huge meter of uh, ice so for example 20 years ago it was not expected at all to increase the temperature of 1.5 celsius degree so to have the ice uh, decrease then there is also another strategy that is the in situ conservation so at farm level it's possible to uh, keep and conserve and and, and practice agrobiodiversity, that is basically what farmers have been done for ages, since the innovation of agriculture in humankind. So farm management as a whole, using from one side the, the gene, the information in the gene, on the other side the knowledge of the farmer, so the local knowledge. 
um, from a modern age, uh, um, plant breeding became a process, uh, um, let's say, scientifically uh, performed. So in, since uh, last, uh, last centuries, breeders and, and agronomists started to improve variety uh, so a bread variety is a variety uh, after our a, a formal process of selection of improvement um, done with some specific uh, goal and target very often at the beginning uh, it was to improve uh, productivity then it was to improve quality or specific part of quality um, I will focus more on cereal because um, it's mainly the, the bank of seed in, in Polenza that I'm dealing with is focus on wheat. So for example, the situation in Italy, um, we are not uh, self-sufficient uh, for our uh, wheat, uh, common wheat uh, to, uh, let's say, to fulfill the needs of the milling and of the bakery and uh, other um, processor uh, industry and we import uh, uh, common wheat from France, uh, Austria, um, Germany, US uh, and uh, for example Ukrainian and some, some also part of North Africa. So we import every year something like five uh, megatons of, of uh, wheat um, and so massive imports uh, um, decrease the availability of local varieties of course uh, and the industry always required um, seeds with high technological performance, so for one side more productive, on the other side very uni uniform, um, very efficient in the external input and with some uh, functional quality, in particular very rich uh, in gluten that um, imply a fast uh, uh, baking process and high temperature, so very fast. And that's why for the farmer, um, the cereal sector is not anymore um, an economic sector. So the, the amount of cost uh, and, and the sales of the product is not anymore positive. Um, this is how in Italy the uh, wheat is classified according to the amount of protein, basically. So we have strong gluten variety, um, variety that are um, uh, able to become bread um, or unable to become bread, where the, the, when the amount of uh, nitrogen in, is below a certain level, so the amount of protein is below 11 percentage. And so in the market it's possible to find uh, a list of variety, of common wheat variety, that uh, potentially can express uh, uh, a good amount of uh, protein. Of course, uh, if uh, the, the crop is able to extract, to uptake nitrogen from the soil. That means two things. There is nitrogen available in the soil and in a form that is uh, uh, that, that the plant roots can absorb. Hmm? This is the increase of uh, WVU um, parameter that is uh, indirectly um, is, the, is the surface of the curve uh, uh, when we do the Chopin analysis. So it's indirectly the uh, strength and the, um, the gluten content of, um, of a dough, of a wheat uh, flour. Um, and and it, it was, sorry, the consequence of a genetic formal improvement. So we selected, I mean, uh, during the year, variety, wheat variety, if, uh, that were um, during time more uh, stronger. On the other hand, uh, um, why local and traditional varieties of wheat are um, becoming, again, <laughs> very interesting? Because uh, local and traditional variety are um, can be grown in a marginal environment or in, in, in environmental friendly methods, organic farming, uh, where we don't want to add a high amount of nitrogen into the soil, in particular solu soluble nitrogen, that means chemical nitrogen. Um, what is a local variety or a land race? A local variety is the result of a long-term process, so it lacks uh, formal genetic improvements, and it is a long-term uh, variety that is adapted in a specific area, in a specific cultivation, with a traditional use. Okay, so it's called local variety because it has a good relationship with the, within pedoclimatic condition and also um, the knowledge 
and the habits of the use of this variety. In cereal, local varieties generally are adapted to uh, marginal area, not uh, rich soil. They are very high, very tall, because uh, the dwarf modern variety, the dwarf uh, of the variety was introduced in modern genetic uh, improvement. They are generally less productive in, uh, um, in good, in good uh, uh, condition, but in bad climatic condition, the result of our research show that they produce, they are more resilient, they are uh, more resistant to climate changes. Um, they can grow, so they can have, let's say, good yield, good, I mean, for example, two tons, not five, um, also without chemicals, um, and are generally not good, uh, not very much high content gluten, so they are not suitable for in production, but they are very good in artisanal bread, in particular the sugar dough process, where the gluten is very digestible, and so richer in minerals and a lot of good taste that are uh, the result of the um, of the connection between uh, specific um, uh, yeast and, and bacteria and the flour. Um, the third concept uh, is the conservation variety. So there are, uh, let's say, formal bread variety, uh, local traditional variety, and the third level is the conservation variety. A conservation variety is a land race or a variety that is traditionally grown but is under uh, treatment of genetic erosion. So it's a variety that is not anymore available for the local market, and so we need to conserve in order to keep it. There is, a, in, at, in, at the Italian level, in um, list, there is a CNN ministerial uh, list. Um, and this is a beautiful picture from a, a cooperative uh, in um, one of the first organic uh, cooperative in, uh, in Piedmont. Um, in Alessandria province. And this is the, um, for example, the list of uh, um, common wheat uh, uh, variety that are enrolled into the Italian National Register of Commerce Conservation Variety. So there are not many at the moment. Um, so we have some uh, variety, for example, Andriolo, Ardito, Autonomia, Frassineto, Gentil Rosso. So many of them are. Um, from more than one region, let's say in North Italy, some of them are from South Italy, um, because them were population, for example, Gentil Rosso population was uh, really cultivated uh, from North Italy till um, Central South, so it was spread everywhere. Um, so how do we work with, uh, um, with, with farmers in order to uh, improve uh, and disseminate uh, uh, conservation and local variety? From, I learned this from uh, uh, Salvatore Ceccarelli, a professor of uh, genetics uh, that worked for many years in Icarda, in Syria, uh, and the Rese um, Mirorali, so an association that uh, I also co-founded many years ago, um, that supported uh, a lot of the this kind of work uh, all along Italy and in, with other association also in Europe. So the participatory selection process is a way to work uh, together with the farmer in order to, so we cultivate a different variety in the field and then we choose uh, together with the farmer, the miller, the technician, um, the consumer, the best variety. So this is a participatory selection process. So it's not just the, gen the genetics or the agronomist that select the variety according to the goal that he or she think is the best, but it's the result of a, a common goal, so a participatory selection process. This is, was my field uh, of crop uh, that I, when we were doing the participatory selection process, uh, this farm, because I do this activity since 2008 uh, in Piedmont when I moved from Toscany to UNISC. Um, here we are in uh, Ceretto farm. Um, and uh, if you want to improve, uh, there is also two, two books in Italian written by Ceccarelli and um, disseminated by Pentagora. So the participatory farm reading is a 
um, is not a conventional breeding, but means uh, to use different point of view in order to select the best variety. The final step uh, is to uh, work with evolutionary from breeding. That means um, to, instead of conservation, so the, from one side there is the goal to conserve the local variety. That means uh, um, to keep the variety you know, for conservation strategies. Um, uh, inside of this, or together with this, uh, um, we, we try to produce mixture, so a blend uh, uh, that uh, will uh, be exposed to uh, natural selection. Um, and the result is a mix of different varieties that are really adapted to that climate, to that soil condition. So it's much faster than any uh, formal breeding improvement. So the use of mixture, uh, we have worked together. This is the middle is Salvatore Ceccarelli. In this picture, there are many uh, people involved uh, since many years in this process. For example, also my, also my professor of genetics, uh, uh, Stefano Benedettelli. And so I try to do the same when I move in 2008 uh, in UNISC. Um, we, uh, let's say, th this activity was also became stronger when we developed the Master of Bread in uh, 2014. Um, so with a group of students, um, we develop and say the, the idea also to improve uh, the selection of variety also for bread production. Um, and we disseminate a lot of this activity. Every year we have our um, catalogs uh, camp, so a field in a farm, in an organic farm, where we plant our uh, the list of variety that we have at the, at the moment we have around 80 different local variety um i again i do this activity in collaboration with uh, other association of course uh, zero food support for example in liguria for many years we have done a local um, a research project for three years um region of piedmont uh, for um, two, two times have uh, supported with little project for example at the moment we have germonte um, and the other association to which I collaborate is uh, IAB, Associazione Italiana Agricoltura Biologica from Piedmont and Rete di Semi Rurali. And for example, there is a European project, Diversi Food, that uh, um, have sustained uh, the development of this uh, field. Here we are in uh, Alta Langa. Um, so we sem here we are in uh, Liguria. Uh, here we are again in another farm in, in, uh, in the field of uh, Papavero Rosso. Uh, this is the, the owner of Papavaro Rosso, the, 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 the bakers that select also together with us the, 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 the seeds. And this is the last, uh, the last year uh, catalog. So we have this 77th uh, accession that we test. We, we harvest in different way, manually or with little machine according to the availability. Um, we make, of course, uh, some, uh, let's say some uh, collection and you find uh, part of this uh, also in Aula 6 in our university and at the moment we are working with the region of Piedmont to make a website where we describe uh, all the local varieties and basically the bank of seed is very simple so it's a fridge where we store our varieties and I use it for didactic purpose with you with students and um, and this is the collection of some uh, local varieties that we have in our in our six and of course uh, for me it's a research activity so i have published a different paper about uh, this issue also in collaboration with other um, professor for example luisa torri so as a final conclusion I want to say that um, um, local varieties are very interesting, in particular when there are adverse climatic years, and this is, will be our daily, our normal activity because the climate is not any more stable. So in order, genes means information. So in order to have more uh, diversified uh, information in the fields means more adaptation. Uh, in, in, in some locality, we have to test which is the best variety, also performing uh, some qualitative and quantitative issue. And the mixture are very, very promising. So when we have a mixture in the field, uh, very often produce much more, or anyhow, more than the single uh, variety. And the work about participatory, transdisciplinary, also the 
uh, work to work together with uh, with other associations. It's it's a very nice activity to share vision. And in Piedmont at the moment uh, we are uh, sustaining. Anyhow, there are several local bread uh, chain uh, where farmer can are are now autonomous to rezone our our um, mixture and our varieties. So I uh, I hope I make it uh, clear. And um, now I want uh, to ask if there are some uh, some questions. I stop. Uh, sorry, to share the screen. Um, well. Um, ecco. Okay, so I see that there are more or less 30 people. Um, I, I know that for some of you, uh, we're not, um, maybe not completely new, but um, again, I, for me, it's important to make uh, the, these three pillars um, in connection. <clears throat> Are there any question or clarification question or also doubts? I have a question. Yes. Do you hear me? Yes, I hear you. Hi. Yeah. I wanted to ask, hi, um, what is the situation of um, cereals productivity during the epidemic? If there has been more investment into uh, production of grains in general for uh, since it's a staple food for for us and uh, also if you can explain a bit more precisely what is a local variety uh but sometimes it can be a bit blurred uh, definition right it is <clears throat> thank you for the question you mean in this period of pandemic in in this right period about uh, covid emergency yeah. no let's say no there is no any there is no program at all, at least not in, in Europe, as far as I know. Um, in Italy, the farmer are, were left, uh, again, alone. It's not new. Um, and uh, you know that during the lockdown, even the farmer were asked to lock down. That is completely nonsense because the plant, the animal, the soil need to be, um, to be continuously uh, cared. Um, and the uh, the, the, let's say there is a huge increase of uh, or demand about organic and local production. This is clear. So mm -hmm. cities and consumer have increased the demand. On the other hand, uh, uh, let's say so only farmers that were already able uh, and already organized to sell directly somehow took this this occasion. But you know, a cereal farm uh, being just, let's say, if it is just a cereal farm, so that stop mm -hmm. the production about uh, stable food, as you said, so about cereals, they don't have any accessibility to the market. Instead, mm -hmm. uh, you have a, a farm, if you have a farm that is able to have the technological and also the knowledge to um, store the, the grain, mill and produce flour and even maybe to produce some product and sell it directly, they can benefit from, from this. So it depends a lot on the structure and on the management of the farm. Mm. And this is valid also for any other fresh product, also for lact yeah. lacto tomato or uh, you know that for many months, uh, for two months, uh, also the um, the open markets were closed. Yeah. So the farmer, uh, let's say, only some farmer are able to drive uh, and deliver at home. Uh, let's say, is is not something that it's uh, they have to invent at this part. Yeah, I think like as a strategy for the future, like as a Euro, is a European yeah. Union, there would be some yeah. investment for uh, yeah. organic or like local yeah. production. Yeah, this is of course what I'm also working for. Um, mm. For example, with an association that I I'm involved directly, um, we 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 wrote a reform of CAP that goes also in that direction, so to improve. Uh, of course, um, aids and policy for agroecology and organic, um, and also to improve short chain connection, short uh, food, so agro food system that are 
short and 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 local that are not the, is not the same things of course no it can be can be short and distant and can be <laughs> local but not short okay so um yes so let's say uh, i hope so you know that european union published the green deal so the parliament is aware about this uh, and um, uh, there are some good uh, light at the end of the tunnel then we have to see how it will uh, really be uh, published next month, the, in particular the CAP, the, the Common Agricultural Policy that will make a strong, um, a strong impact on, on, on farming. So I'm not 100%, uh, let's say, sure that something will happen, but I'm very, I'm full of hope. <laughs> and, and I did something concrete to, to do it. Uh, then your second question about what is a local variety is is not um, I agree with you it's not so easy let's say there is a precise legal uh, definition um, on the other hand uh, on for example the com the conservation variety is now um, again due to another European law we have now a national registration so any country in Europe have a clear national um, uh, reg register to to see if uh, a variety is um, have the right to to be called conservation variety so uh, if the there is a policy need to conserve uh, not to protect and enhance on the other hand the local variety concept is very um, it's much more unclear because again uh, I, I will keep the, the, the cereal example. So a local variety is a variety that has been grown no, for many years, with traditional habits in a place. Um, but uh, if, I, if I introduce, uh, let's say, in Bra, in Piedmont, a variety that uh, was traditional and local in another area, so in Veneto, but was not, uh, so I have similar characteristics, but was not, we, didn't, we don't have historical proof that, uh, uh, was grown also in Piedmont. It is a local variety officially, but it's not uh, the right locality. <laughs> okay, so you produce a bread from a variety that is local from Veneto, not from Piedmont. So mm -hmm. it's not, not easy. It's not easy to identify. And uh, again, there is um, every region uh, have to develop. There is a national plan for agrobiodiversity in any country, and mm -hmm. it the task of the region uh, because the agricultural uh, policy and agricultural stuff uh, is region. at regional level to identify which are uh, the variety and also the race for animal for species is the same of uh, regional um, importance okay. some, some, some region did this work already 20 15 years ago so they are very let's say already in a good mature stage some other region haven't done almost anything and mm. i must say that also the region of piedmont started and also for some uh, for some species and not for all of them okay grazie right. uh hilde you have your hand the rise hello can you hear me yes so thank you for a very interesting talk and I was wondering about, since slow food somehow emerged from Italy, and I was wondering you know, if that has had like a general bigger impact of the national agriculture, that there is like a general higher awareness of agroecology in Italy than other European countries, or like somehow how this slow food movement has impacted the national uh, agriculture. Mm -hmm. Um, let's say, uh, I think that slow food played a very important impact. Um, on the other hand, I can't uh, quantify, let's say I don't have, um, I don't have a study or data that, uh, that I can share with you. But um, yes, I think that, that, that slow food in national economy, in, in, in national, also in, uh, in common people, I would say, increased tremendously the awareness about uh, uh, local food, uh, agrobiodiversity. Um, they are. They made a huge uh, communication effort with uh, Presidia project, uh, 
um, with all the say since already more than 25 years. So uh, they were pioneer. Mr. Uh, so Food is pioneer in in this activity uh, in time and nobody talked about it. Um, now maybe there are much uh, not also other association, but uh, for sure the, the 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 work that the biodiversity group uh, did in the food is amazing. This is my personal opinion. I don't have um, precise data about in terms of impact. Do you know if there are any studies done about this? Uh, yes, uh, let's say I have uh, in mind a paper that I can share with you um, that a master thesis uh, student of, of, of mine did many, many years ago when I still was in Florence. Uh, um, it was more about uh, sustainability assessment and procedure. And myself with other two colleagues, of, one colleague of Torino and another professor from from. Uh, Palermo or Catania, sorry. Um, we did also for, but it's, it was more to assess uh, uh, after 10 years, the, the research question was after 10 years of Presidia project, uh, what are the effects uh, in uh, social, economic, and environmental sustainability, in particular for farmers? And um, you can find this paper in uh, ResearchGate in, under my name. I can share with you, um, and uh, we have found out that uh, all of them, the three issues of sustainability increase, but the most affected one was the social sustainability. So the farmer being part of a group, uh, of a relationship, of a network, they become, the farmer, they become aware of their importance, and, and they were not anymore, let's say, depressed, uh, neglected, uh, invisible. Okay. Thank you very much. Short term. <laughs> uh, Eva, do you have a question? Hi, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I had a, a question, it's a, a bit in the line of the first question, um, because uh, yesterday I had a sort of internal discussion with myself about it, uh, thinking uh, which farmers are going to have the worst problem in this corona time and after this corona time is it the bigger ones the medium-sized ones or the large ones because i could find arguments for all of them but i just couldn't yeah. i don't know i would like to know your opinion about it yeah i uh, i agree with you let's say the dimension play a role a role but it's not the only the only factors of course because we can have uh, large farm that are very diversified uh, and small farm that uh, paradoxically could be very homogeneous. So let's say dimension play a role, but it's not the, the only way to judge. Um, anyhow, I, I, I will give this similar answer. The farmer that were already organized and able to, to, to reach the market independently, let's say directly, are the one that could, could make uh, Maybe not a profit, but anyhow, that maybe are happy about. So I know, I know, I'm very, for example, I'm very into the organic sector in Italy because I, I've worked there for 25 years. Um, I know that the shop, uh, this already farmer that uh, goes, uh, that have a direct connection, uh, they they are very happy. But many others that uh, deal with uh, maybe some gross value chain uh, and they are not able already to process the product so they sell the gross uh, they are blocked because the the in particular conventional sector that export can you imagine how difficult it is at the moment exports are very very decreased and almost blocked so uh, some of them are in, in big uh, in big trouble some other are improving and making, uh, let's say, some also some profit. I would say, or at least uh, they feel that the, that the, some consumer are searching for them, and this is yeah. a very could, good. Uh, could there result. be, could there be a, a sort of a guide or something to help those farmers that miss the direct contact to the? Uh, okay, maybe is is not a guidelines, but let's say because. <laughs> that part uh, already CAP uh, tried to do it, uh, I must admit, let's say um, for many years uh, the policy was driven to improve uh, processing, farm level processing and, and 
uh, from one side. On the other hand, uh, there is even more uh, linear massification of the agrofood system. So uh, we all know that the market is dominated by three, four, five, six big, big company. So the farm is nothing uh, compared to that. Um, I don't know. In cereal, cargill is moving uh, millions of tons around the world. Okay, so let's say, uh, and and in order to become independent from big, uh, or, at, or at least less dependent from the big market, uh, you need a, you need resource. You need uh, also uh, basically uh, the fact, that, for example, that uh, you own the land that is not renting or uh, the fact that maybe you are young because you are investing in your farm. So if you are old, you are renting the land, uh, you are not so willing to do investment. This is the, a basic rule about the economy no? in agriculture. So um, it, it's a complex issue. It's not just lack of money. Eh? It's not only that. It's a much more strategic, uh, uh, complex uh, action. Anyhow, family farms or farms that earn a living from, from, from farm, farming, um, they can access some, uh, they can access some, let's say, aids in order to reach uh, the consumer today a little bit more easily than maybe uh, a few months ago, I, I would say.